Charlotte Doyle, Part 2. Now, I know this will look backwards to you, but we're not the next chapter. Part 2. Now, pay attention. Think of Part 1, Part 2. What does that usually mean in a book? If you have a Part 2, it's something much different than Part 1. So let's see how the rest of the book is different than the first of the book. Charlotte Doyle, Chapter 13, Part 2. For a second time, I stood in the forecastle. The room was as dark and mean as when I'd first seen it. Now, however, I stood as a petitioner in sailor's garb. A glum fisk was at my side. It hadn't been easy to convince him that I was in earnest about becoming one of the crew. Even when he begrudged a willingness to believe in my sincerity, he warned that agreement from the rest of the men would be improbable. He insisted I lay the matter before them immediately. So it was that the three men from Mr. Hollybrass's watch, Grimes, Dillingham, and Foley, were the next to hear my plea. As Fisk had foretold, they were contemplating me and my proposal with very little evidence of favor. I do mean it, I said, finding boldness with repetition. I want to be a replacement for Mr. Johnson. You're a girl, Dillingham spat out contemptuously. A pretty girl, Foley put in. It was not meant to be a compliment. Takes more than canvas breeches to hide that. And a gentlewoman, said Grimes' addition, as though that was the final evidence of my essential uselessness. I want to know that I stand with you, I pleaded, that I made a mistake. A mistake, Foley snapped. Two able-bodied men have died. Besides, Dillingham agreed, you'll bring more trouble than good. You can teach me, I offered. God's fist, Grimes cried. She thinks this is a school. And the captain, Foley asked, what'll he say? He wants nothing to do with me, I replied. That's what he says, but you were his darling girl, Miss Doyle. He takes you in, and he'll want you back again. Where will that put us? So it went round and round. While the men made objections, and while I struggled to answer them, Fisk said nothing. Though I tried to keep my head up, my eyes steady, it was not easy. They looked at me as if I were some loathsome thing. And at the same time, the more objections they made, the more determined I was to prove myself. See here, Miss Doyle, Dillingham concluded. It's no simple matter. Understand, you sign on to the articles, so to speak, and you are on. No bolding to safe harbors at the first blow, or when an ill word is flung your way. You're a hand, or you're not a hand, and it won't go easy. That's all that can ever be promised. I know, I said. Hold out your hands, he demanded. Fist nudged me, and I held them out, palms up. Foley peered over them. Like bloody cream, he said with disgust. Touch mine, he insisted, and extended his. Gingerly, I touched one of them. His skin was like rough leather. That's the hands you'll get, miss, like an animal. Is that what you want? I don't care, I said stoutly. Finally, it was Dillingham who said, and are you willing to take your place in the rigging, too, fair weather or foul? That made me pause. Fisk got, caught the hesitation. Answer, he prompted. Yes, I said boldly. They exchanged glances and then Foley asked, What do the others think? Fisk shook his head and sighed. No doubt they'll speak the same. Suddenly, Grimes says, Here's what I say. Let her climb to the royal yard. Now, you got to remember, the royal yard is the top of the boat. If she does it and comes down whole and is still willing to serve, then I say let her sign and be bloody damned like the rest of us. And do whatever she's called on to do, no less. With no more than grunts, the men seemed to agree among themselves, and they turned toward me. Now, what does Miss Doyle say? Grimes demanded. I swallowed hard. But all the same, I gave yet an, another yes. Foley came to his feet. All right, then. I'll go caucus the others. And out he went. Fisk and I retreated to the galley while I waited for word. During that time, he questioned me regarding my determination. Miss Doyle, he pressed, you have agreed to climb to the top of the royal yard. 
Do you know that's the highest sail on the main mast? It's 130 feet up. Now imagine that, 130 feet. You can reach it only two ways. You can shimmy up the mast itself, or you can climb the shrouds using the rat lines for your ladder. I nodded as if I fully grasped what he was saying. The truth was, I didn't even wish to listen. I just wanted to get past the test. And Miss Doyle, he went on, if you slip and fall, you'll be lucky to drop into the sea and drown quickly. No mortal can pluck you out fast enough to save you. Do you understand that? I swallowed hard, but nodded, yes. I gagged, forced my stomach down, drew breath, and looked out. Though I didn't think it possible, the ocean appeared to have grown greater yet. And when I looked down, the upturned faces of the crew appeared like so many tiny bugs. There were 25 or so more feet to climb. Once again, I grasped the rigging and hauled myself up. This final climb was torture. With every upward play, the swaying of the ship seemed to increase. Even when not moving myself, I was flying through the air in wild gyrations. The horizon kept shifting, tilting, dropping. I was increasingly dizzy, nauseous, terrified, certain that with every next moment, I would slip and fall to death. I paused again and again, my eyes on the rigging inches from my face gasping and praying as I had never prayed before. One hope was that nearer to heaven now I could make my desperation heard. Inch by inch, I continued up. Half an inch, a quarter inch. But then, at last, with trembling fingers, I touched the spar of the royal yard. I had reached the top. Once there, I endeavored to rest again. But there, the metronome motion of the mast was at its most extreme. The seahawk was turning, tossing, swaying as if trying to shake me off, like a dog throwing droplets of water from its back. And when I looked beyond, I saw a sea that was infinity itself, ready, eager to swallow me whole. I had to get back down. As hard as it was to climb up, it was, to my horror, harder returning. On the ascent, I could see where I was going. Edging down, I had to grope blindly with my feet. Sometimes I tried to look, but when I did, the sight of the void below was so sickening, I was forced to close my eyes. Each groping step downward was a nightmare. Many times, my foot found only air. Then, as if to mock my horror and mock my terror, a small breeze at last sprang up. Sails began to fill and snap, puffing in and out, at times smothering me. The tossing of the ship grew, if that were possible, more extreme. Down I crept, past the top gallant where I paused briefly on the trestle tree, and then down along the longest stretch, toward the main yard. It was there I fell. I was searching with my left foot for the next rat line. When I found a hold and started to put my weight upon it, my foot, slipping on the slick tar surface, shot forward. The suddenness of it made me lose my grip. I tumbled backward, but in such a way that my legs became entangled in the lines. There I hung, head downward. I screamed, tried to grab something, but I couldn't. I clutched madly at nothing. Still my hand brushed against a dangling rope. I grabbed for it, missed, and grabbed again. Using all my strength, I levered myself up, wrapping my arms into the lines, and made a veritable knot of myself, the mast, and the rigging. Oh, how I wept, my entire body shaking and trembling as though it would break apart. When my breathing became somewhat normal, I managed to untangle first one arm and then my legs. I was free. I continued down. By the time I reached the main yard, I was numb and whimpering again, tears coursing from my eyes. I moved to the shrouds I'd climbed and edged myself past the lowest of the sails. As I emerged from under it, the crew gave out a great huzzah! Oh, how my heart swelled with exultation. Finally, when I reached close to the very end, Barlow stepped forward, beaming, his arms uplifted. Jump, he called, jump! But now, determined to do it all myself, I shook my head. Indeed, in the end, I dropped down on my own two India rubber legs and tumbled to the deck. No sooner did I land when the crew gave me another huzzah. 
With the joyous heart, I staggered to my feet. Only then did I see Captain Jaggery push through the knot of men and come to stand before me. Charlotte Doyle, Chapter 14 There I stood. Behind me, the semicircle of the crew seemed to recoil from the man and from Mr. Hollybrass, who appeared not far behind. Miss Doyle, the captain said with barely suppressed fury, what is the meaning of this? I stood mute. How could I explain to him? Besides, there are no words left within me. I had gone through too many transformations of mood and spirit within the last 24 hours. When I remained silent, he demanded, Why are you dressed in that scandalous fashion? Answer me! The angrier he became, the darker grew the color of the welt on his face. Who gave you permission to climb into that rigging? I backed up a step and said, I, I have joined the crew. Unable to comprehend my words, Captain Jagger remained staring fixedly at me. Then gradually he did understand. His face flushed red, his fists clenched. Miss Doyle, he said between gritted teeth, you will go to your cabin, remove those obscene garments, and put on your proper dress. You are causing a disruption, and I will not allow it. But when I continued to stand there, unmoving, making no response, he suddenly shouted, Didn't you hear me? Get to your cabin. I won't, I blurted out. I'm no longer a passenger. I'm with them. And so saying, I stepped back until I sensed the men around me. The captain glared at the crew. And you, he sneered. I suppose you'd have her? The response of the men was silence. The captain seemed unsure what to do. Mr. Hollybrass, he barked finally. I'm waiting your orders, sir. The captain flushed again. He shifted his attention back to me. Your father, Miss Doyle, he would not allow this. I think I know my father, an officer in the company who owns this ship and your employer, better than you, I said. He would approve of my reasons. The captain's uncertainty grew. At last, he replied, Very well, Miss Doyle. If you do not assume your proper attire this instant, and if you insist upon playing these games, you shall not be given the opportunity to change your mind. If crew you are, crew you shall remain. I promise I shall drive you as I choose. I don't care what you do, I threw back at him. The captain turned to the first mate. Mr. Hollygrass, remove Miss Doyle's belongings from the cabin. Let her take her place in the forecastle with the crew. Put her down as Mr. Doyle and list Miss Doyle in the log as lost. From this point on, I expect to see that he works with the rest. And with that, he disappeared into the steerage. No sooner had he done so than the crew, though not Mr. Holly Brass, let out another raucous cheer. In just such a fashion did I become a full-fledged crew member of the Seahawk. Whatever grievous errors I made before in thwarting the mutiny led by Cranach and in causing the resulting cruelty toward Zachariah, the sailors appeared to accept my change of heart and position without reservation. They saw my desire to become a crew member, not only as atonement, but as a stinging rebuff to Captain Jaggery. Once I showed myself willing to do what they did by climbing the rigging, and once they saw me stand up to Jaggery, An intense apprenticeship commenced, and for it the crewmen became my teachers. They helped me and worked with me, guided me past the mortal dangers that lurked in every task. In this they were far more patient with all my repeated errors than those teachers at the Barrington School for Better Girls, when there were nothing to learn but penmanship, spelling, and the ancient authors of morality. You may believe me, too, when I say that I shirked no work. Even if I wanted to, it was clear from the start that shirking would not be allowed. I pounded oakum into the deck. I scraped the hull. I stood watch as the dawn blessed the sea and as the moon cut the midnight sky. I tossed the line to measure the depths of the sea. I took my arm at the wheel. I swabbed the deck and tarred the rigging. I spliced ropes and tied knots. My mess was shared with the crew, and I went aloft. Indeed, that first journey to the top of the main mass was but the prelude to many daily climbs. 
Of course, after that first, there were always others who went along with me. High above the sea, my crewmates taught me to work with one hand. The other must hold on to dangle over spars, to reef sails, to edge along the walk ropes. So I came to work every sail at every hour of the day. As for the captain, he was good as his word, no better than his word. He continued to drive his crew without mercy, and since I was now part of it, he drove them, and me in particular, harder than before. But try as he might, he could find no cause for complaint. I would not let him. My knowledge of physical labor had been all but nil, of course. Hardly a wonder, then, that from the moment I joined the crew, I was in pain. I ached as if my body had been racked. My skin turned pink, then red, then brown. The flesh upon my hands broke first into oozing, running sores, and then metamorphosed into a new rough hide, as all as promised. And when my watch was done, I flung myself onto my hammock and slept the sleep of righteousness, though never more than four hours, and more often less. A word must be said about where and how I slept. It will be remembered that the captain denied me my cabin, insisting I take my place in the forecastle with the men. No doubt he thought to humiliate me and force me to return to my former place. The men caucused the first day, and in a meeting they concluded with a sacred oath, bade me take my place along with them, swearing to give me the utmost privacy that they could provide. They would be my brothers, and I no longer to be called Miss Doyle, but Charlotte. I was given a hammock placed in a corner. Around this, a piece of torn sail was tacked up as a kind of curtain. The space was private for me and kept that way. True, I heard and learned their rough language. I confess, too, that in my newfound freedom, I brandished a few bold terms of my own to the amusement of the men at first. But after a while, it became rather second nature to me and to them. I say this not to brag but to suggest the complete absorption I felt in my new life. I came to feel a sense of exhilaration in it such as I'd never felt before. Thus it was that after a fortnight I found myself atop the foremast, hugging the top gallant spar, my bare brown feet nimbly balancing on the foot ropes. It was seven bells of the second dog watch, just before dusk. The wind was out of the northwest. Our sails were taut, our studding sails were set. Below the ship's bow, as though pulled by her winged figurehead, plunged repeatedly, stirring froth and foam. This rocking movement seemed effortless to me now, as if, like the ship's namesake, we were flying. Not far off our starboard bow, dolphins chased the waves, flyers themselves. My hair, uncombed for days, blew free in the salty air. My face, dark with weather, was creased with smile. I was squinting westward into the swollen face of a blood-red sun, which cast a shimmering golden road upon the sea. From where I perched, it seemed we were sailing on the road to a dream. And there I was, joyous, new-made, liberated from a prison I thought was my proper place. The only shadow on my happiness was Captain Jaggery. He came on deck infrequently, and when he did, he was enveloped in the murkiest gloom. Rarely did he speak to anyone but the mates, Mr. Hollybrass and Mr. Johnson now, and only then to give orders or rebukes. Naturally, the captain was the principal subject of endless scuttlebutt in the forecastle during off-watch times. Ewing claimed there was a tension between the captain and the first mate, because Mr. Hollybrass didn't approve of Jaggery's ways. Don't you believe it, said Keach, who, if anything, had grown more tense since his demotion. Hollybrass is a glove to Jaggery's hand. Fisk insisted Jaggery's keeping below so much was only a case of his wanting to hide the welt on his face, of hiding himself in shame. It was Grimes who swore he was pressing us to make a crossing in good time and so prove that he'd done no wrong. But it was Foley who said that I was the cause for the captain's every move. What do you mean, I demanded. I've seen him, Foley insisted. I've studied him. He doesn't come out unless it's your watch. One eye keeps the ship in trim, but the other... What? I said, sensing already that he was right. He's always watching you, Foley said. 
looking around at the others for confirmation, and there's nothing but hatred in his eye. The others nodded in agreement. But why, I asked. He's waiting. He's waiting for you to make a mistake, Morgan put in, taking a deep pull on his pipe, then filling the forecastle with its ac acrid smoke. What kind of mistake, I asked. Something he can use against you. Something that will set him right. Look here, Charlotte, you boxed him in. I did? It was the first moment you joined us. You mentioned your father, didn't you? Said he'd approve of what you've done. Well, he would. He likes, believes in injustice. But there, as, may, as it may, Jaggery didn't know what to do. He gave way. Not a thing he likes, you know. So now I say he's waiting for a mistake on your part to set himself back up. I don't intend to make a mistake. I stated proudly. Fist spat upon the floor. Neither does he. It came to pass, as Morgan promised. To a person on land, the sight of a ship's sails bleached by sun and stretched by wind is the very image of airy lightness. In fact, a sail is made of very heavy canvas. When one gets tangled on a spar, it must be pulled loose quickly or it can tear or burst, and in doing so, pull down the rigging, the spars, and even a mast. A sail out of control can flick like a wild whip and send a full-grown sailor into a senseless spin. It often happens. Now the flying jib is set on the furthest point of the bowsprit, at the very tip of it. When you consider that the bow of a speeding ship on a high sea rises and falls, you will perceive that a broken jib can dip into the sea. Such is the water's force in the driving of the ship that the bowsprit itself can be caused to snap. Thus the sailor who seeks to repair a tangled jib must contend not only with a heavy, flailing sail, but the powerful, rushing sea only a few feet, sometimes closer, below him. One afternoon, two days after our forecastle talk and during my watch, the flying jib became entangled in just that way I have described. As soon as he saw it, Captain Jaggery cried, Mr. Doyle, fix the bowsprit! In his haste to call on me, he spoke directly, not through one of his mates. Before I could respond, Grimes leaped forward, calling, I'll do it, sir. Grimes was one of the bearded ones, quick to flare, but quick to forget. The call was for Mr. Doyle, returned the captain. Does he refuse? No, sir, I said, and I hurried to the night head from which the bowsprit thrust forward. Grimes hurried along with me, offering hasty instructions in my ear, as well as urging a splicing knife upon me. I took it and put it in my pocket. Charlotte, do you see that line out there? He asked, pointing to the twisted line at the far end of the bowsprit that had snarled the jib. I nodded. Don't monkey with the sail itself. All you need to do is cut that rope. The sail will free itself, and we've got others. Mind, you'll need to cut sharp and swing down under the bowsprit in one quick jump, or the sail will toss you in. You understand? Again, I nodded. Time yourself proper. If the ship plunges, the sea will up and grab you. So cocky had I become that I leaped to the head rail with little thought or worry, then set my foot upon the bowsprit itself. Please look in the back of, uh, in your book on, or the in the uh, illustrations that we gave. The bowsprit is a big, long point that sticks out on the front of the boat. I saw that I needed to walk out along this bowsprit some twenty feet, not to a difficult task, I thought, because the back rope was something I could cling to. As I had by now learned to do, I started off by keeping my eyes on the bowsprit and my bare feet, inching step by step along it. The hiss of the water rushing below was pronounced. The bowsprit itself was wet and slippery with foam. No matter. What took me by surprise was the bowsprit's wild bobbing. Halfway along, I glanced back. For the first time since I boarded the ship, I saw the figurehead clearly, the pale white seahawk with wings thrust back against the bow, its head extended forward, its beak open wide in a screen. As the bow dipped, this open beak dropped and dropped again into the sea, coming up each time with foam streaming like a rabid dog. So startled was I by the frightful vision that for a moment I froze until a sudden plunge of the ship almost tumbled me seaward. I reached the crucial point soon enough. 
but only by curling my toes tight upon the bowsprit and holding fast onto the back rope line with one hand was I able to free the other to take Grimes' splicing knife from my pocket. I leaned forward and began to cut. The tightness of the tangled line helped. The knife cut freely. Too much so. The last remaining strand snapped with a crack. The sail boomed out, flicking away at my cutting hand, and the knife went flying into the sea. Even as I lunged for it, the bowsprit plunged. I slipped and started to fall. By merest chance, I made a successful grab at the bowsprit itself, which left me hanging, feet dangling, only a few feet above the rushing sea. So imagine you're on the playground and holding on to the rope. She's hanging from this over the water on the ocean. As the Seahawk plunged and plunged again, I was dunked to my waist, to my chest. I tried to swing myself up to hook my feet over, but I could not. The sea kept snatching at me, trying to pull me down while I dangled there, kicking wildly, uselessly. Twice my head went under. Blinded, I swallowed water, choked, and then I saw that only by timing my leg swings to the upward thrust of the ship could I save myself. The ship heaved skyward. With all my might, I swung my legs up and wrapped them about the bowsprit, but again the Seahawk plunged. Into the tearing sea I went, clutching the spar. Then up. This time I used the momentum to swing over, so I was now atop the bowsprit, straddling it, then lying on it. Someone must have called the, to the man at the helm. The ship shifted course, found easier water, and slowed. It ceased to plunge so. Gasping for breath and spitting seawater, I was able to pull myself along the bowsprit and finally, by stepping on the wooden bird's furious head, I climbed over the rail. Grimes was there to help me onto the deck and gave me an enthusiastic hug of approval. The captain, of course, watched me stony-faced. Mr. Doyle, he barked, come here. Though greatly shaken, I had no time to be frightened. I had done the task, and I knew I'd done it. I hurried to the quarter deck. When I ask you to do a job, the captain said, it's you I ask and not another. You caused us to change course and to lose time. And before I could respond, he struck me across the face with the back of his hand and then turned and walked away. My reaction was quick. Coward, I screamed. Fraud. He spun around and he began to stride back toward me, his scarred face contorted in rage. But I, in a rage, wouldn't give way. I can't wait till Providence, I shouted at him. I'll go right to the courts. You won't be Captain Long. You'll be seen by everyone in the cruel despot that you are. And I spat upon the deck on his boots. My words made him turn as pale as a ghost. A ghost with murder in his eye. But then abruptly he gained control of himself, and as he'd done on previous occasions, he whirled about, and left the deck. I turned away, feeling triumphant. Much of the crew had seen it all, but there were no more hurrahs. The moment passed. Nothing more was said, save by Grimes, who insisted I take lessons in handling a knife, carrying it, using it, and even throwing it. On my first watch off, he had me practice on the deck for three hours. Two more days passed without incident. In that time, however, the sky turned a perpetual gray. The air thickened with moisture. Winds rose and fell in what I thought was a peculiar pattern. Toward the end of the day, when Barlow and I were scraping down the capstan, I saw a branch on the waves, and a red bird was perched on the branch. Look, I cried with delight. Does that mean we're close to land? Barlow hauled himself up to take a look. He shook his head. That bird's from the Caribbean. A thousand miles off. I've seen them there. It's called a blood bird. What's it doing here? And after a moment he said, storm driven. I looked at him in surprise. What kind of storm would blow a bird that far? I asked, wide eyed. Hurricane. What's a hurricane? The worst storm of all. Can't we sail around? Barlow again glanced at the helm, the sails, and then at the sky above. He frowned. 
I heard Mr. Hollybrass and Jaggery arguing about it. To my understanding, he said, I don't think the captain wants to avoid it. Why not? It's what Grimes has been saying. The captain's trying to move fast. If he sets us right at the hurricane's edge, it'll blow us home like a pound of shot in a two-pound cannon. What if he doesn't get it right? It's two pounds of shot in a one-pound cannon.